All right, moving on from metal props. Um, well, the one thing I didn't mention about metal props is I did mention all the damage you get to the, the tips of the metal props. Uh, not tips, along the leading edge. It's just really common. You can run your fingernail down it and kind of catch it and stuff. And that's not good. Every time you have even the slightest blemish along that uh, trailing or leading edge, you're creating a stress riser where the <coughs> propeller could crack and that piece could break off. So that's a really, really bad thing to have happen. So you never want to ignore any sort of rock chip or anything that you can catch your fingernail in. It's got to be, I think, addressed immediately. And um, one of the things that you know I was taught to do is draw a file it, which is basically to take a file and just run down the entire uh, blade leading edge, just clean off any imperfections and sand it down real smooth. And that is common. And then then put some alodyne on it and paint it. Um, as I move into composite propellers, composite propellers also have a metal tip on it. Uh, it's stainless or manel, similar to a wood prop. Uh, don't file that. It's not supposed to be filed. It's like a sticker. So you can replace it, but don't, don't file. So, uh, all right, so let's see, composite props. And these are really new to the industry. How long have you guys, you were a C-130, right? Mm -hmm. How long have you had composites? Uh, the H3s had them, Super H3s, so 80s. <laughs> that's new. <laughs> <laughs> aviation, that's like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, the first J model came out in 83, so okay. I had composite. Wow. All right, so we have several. Several companies are now making are now making composite props. Well, certified home built for everything. Before it was just home built. You had a certified aircraft. You had a wood or metal. That that was it. And then you the <coughs> experimentals. They started using composite type props and then now they're out there so one of the I think the biggest names out there is MT propeller that's M and the letter T not E M P T Y uh, material it is hand selected as opposed to machine selected so we're gonna go with their uh, you know their brochure, hand selected multiple laminated German ash wood. Because ash is a type of wood. Ash wood. It is then covered by epoxy fiberglass. <coughs> and sealed by a coating of acrylic polyurethane. The critical sections of the blade leading edge is protected by bonded on, I mean stuck on, stainless steel erosion sheath they call it the blades leading edge le is protected by a bonded on stainless steel erosion sheath. There are companies out there too, by the way, that make blade protectors. I want to say there's some that's like, it's a clear kind of like you, a wrap like you get for cars. 
You guys seen that for your planes? I forget what they're called. Edge protectors or something. It's some, you can get those now. Um, so yeah, I like these MT propellers. We have one on our 172 out there. And it's taken a beating and it's still hanging on there. Um, let's see. New form. We've got uh, Hartzell making one over here. Um, looks like a Macaulay. I don't even have a picture of an MT prop on here. Actually, those colors, kind of a green color. Um, so there's all different kinds. Let me see, do I have an MT prop on here? I do not. All right. And then there's this one here. And I would just feel sad if I didn't mention this prop over here. And I really wish I had more of the history on, on this one here. It's called an Ivo prop. Um, and if I have it correct, and I think I have some of my information correct, it was designed by a Russian guy who was just some super kind of genius person who made this prop. And I, don't, I think there, there's an incredible backstory. I feel bad that I don't know about him leaving Russia and bringing this prop to the United States. And I've flown behind these props. They're pretty cool. Um, we have one here somewhere. Uh, but they're a complete carbon fiber prop. And they're kind of unique in that, well, they're very unique. Uh, this is a three blade, but if you want to make it a two blade, just unbolt it and take that blade out and take the two blades and put it right here and put some spacers right there. It's just, you can convert it. I mean, if you want to make it a four blade, I think you can take out some spacers and move these two up and make another one. And it, there's some way in there where it is somewhat ground adjustable it's got this big nut on the front where you can kind of crank on it. And it's kind of, it's weird. Um, like I said, I, that, uh, that Smith mini plane that I, I saw, they used to fly. He had one on the front and it was weird. And it's the only time I ever want to do this. But if you stood and watch it when the RPM changed, you would see it kind of make all kinds of weird movements and stuff. But it's really smooth and cool prop. So that was the Ivo prop, all carbon fiber. It was kind of cool. So... There's all kind of stuff out there. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, the one on the Skycatcher. That's Skycatcher, Cessna Skycatcher. I know not a lot about them. It's a plastic airplane. See, Macaulay made one for them as an all composite two blade fixed pitch prop specifically designed for the Cessna 162 Skycatcher's Continental Motors O200D engine. The prop consists of a continuous fiber single piece design giving high strength as well as lightweight. The, this prop is five foot six inches diameter and weighs just 9.3 pounds, which is 14.2 pounds less than the aluminum propeller that it replaced. All right, installation. Some of this should be a little bit of a repeat from what we've already had in another class. Like, I don't remember it. We have three types of crankshafts. Do you remember what all three are? This is the interactive part. I said I could just sit here. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was up until now. Now it's time to get to work. <laughs> spline, shaft. spline shaft. All right, we have spline. We have the flange. Huh? What do you say? It's got to say it louder. Taper. Taper. Thank you. Taper. We've got the flanged, flanged there, flanged here. We got the taper over here, and we got the splined over here. Let's talk about the flanged right here. We have continental and light coming flange type. All right, flanged. I regret that the engine that you're working on, the 290, 
I think as they came to us, wherever they got, and they were here when I got here, the bushings that went in the flanges are not the right bushings. It's almost like, you know, they pick through a bucket and go, oh, here's some bushings. These bushings should actually be indexed and they have a certain way they're going to go in and there's actually some different ones. And these different ones will then indicate sometimes exactly how the prop has to go on. So it is lightly idiot resistant. Is that offensive to say that? <laughs> it's the term. Now, I don't say idiot proof because they're not idiot proof. Um, they're somewhat idiot resistant. They're, they're there to help you line the propeller up where it should go. In theory, you should be able to look at not only the starter ring gear support that has the little O on it, because look at this right here. See how kind of uh, that one's not sticking out? Yeah, I think I'm always amazed when I pull this picture of like, oh, that's about what I'm going to talk about. Somebody screwed up, and that's what happened with the screw up. But there should be one of these bushings is different than the others. It's probably that one right there, isn't it? Uh, let me see. I think it's that one it's one is smaller one is smaller than all the other ones it might be that one it's got the little shoulder on it right there so it's smaller here and then it got bigger right there kind of hard to tell and um, this should only fit on usually one way to not always but anyway so the propeller is going to have so if we have uh, one two three four five of one size and one of another you would turn the propeller around and you'd look at the back of it and go, hey, five of these holes are the same size and one is a little bit different. And they can be hard to spot, but that's the way it goes. And so these bushings, I'm talking almost specific about a light coming here, are pressed in like this. And then the propeller should have one hole that is able to go over one of these pilots. Well, if you screw up and put the prop on incorrectly, there will be a smaller hole that will then press on a larger bushing. And when you push the prop on, it will simply push that bushing out the back of the propeller flange. And that's what happened in this case. It's not supposed to be sunk back in there. It's supposed to be sticking out like that, but somebody put the prop on wrong, had a small hole right there. You're gonna be okay? Small, small hole. They shoved it over this one and just pushed the bushing right out the back. And if we were to turn around and look at the back, you'd see that bushing pushed way out and a prop bolt through it. And like, ah, so you're really being held on by a couple other bolts. So a couple of problems. One, the prop is now misindexed to the engine, so you could have vibration problems. And you have a prop that's not being held on very well. So you have to be very careful. There is a service bulletin that tells you exactly where these bushings are supposed to be put in relation to the engine and what size they are. All right. Um, this one, you can see the index pins here. So the prop will just have a, a whole blind holes right there. So it'll line up with those index pins. So that's on the flange. All right. Uh, several types. So not all flanges are the same. So there are several types. types of uh, types and sizes of flanges. In fact, I got a call, I don't know, it wasn't a couple years ago. Uh, somebody had, let's tell like it is, no, exp <laughs> no, no business doing this, but they built an O235 engine for a Cessna 152 out of some parts that they got. And uh, so the person built up the engine and put it in the airplane and then called me up and said, hey, I have a problem. The prop doesn't fit on this flange. I said, well, the two things. One, you could have the wrong bushings in it because, you know, did, did this engine come out of that? No, no, I got a, you know, crankshaft from this guy, and case from that guy or something like that, I don't know. Definitely replaced the crankshaft. And I said, or, there's a service bulletin that talks about the different types of flanges, and I think the 235 has two different types of flanges. One is bigger, one is smaller. Did you verify that you put in the same crankshaft flange as the one you took out? Same flange as the one I took out? I'm like, uh-oh, you repeated my question. I know we're in trouble. 
So come back. Nope, nope. This one is definitely a different size than the one that came out of the airplane. I said, well, then that's going to take a different prop. Well, I mean, the holes don't line up, but there's a spot where I could drill some extra holes in the propeller. <laughs> Said, man, don't do that. There's air within his directives on that particular propeller for cracks in that area. I wouldn't do it. I heard that he did it. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> How's he doing now? Huh? How's he doing now? I hasn't gotten caught yet. <laughs> when the NTSB is picking up pieces of prop and going, where the hell did these holes come from? So anyway, what was the correct fix? can't get a new prop because that crankshaft flange was never designed to go into that engine that went into that aircraft because that would change the model designation of the aircraft engine. So if you had like an 0235 L2C, which is what the uh, 152s took, but you had an 0235, I don't know, N2C, I'm making up numbers because I don't know the other ones, that's the difference, the crankshaft. So you've technically converted the L2C into some other version and then put it on. So you violated the, S the type certificate of the aircraft. And when you go to buy a prop, none of the props that will fit that crankshaft are type certificated to go onto that aircraft because that aircraft now has an illegal engine. See the line that it creates? So you're, to so you're really, your only true way to fix it is to yeah, drill the holes in the prop. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you, you wouldn't get an STC because I don't think anybody's at the time, effort, energy, and money to create the paperwork to put the wrong crankshaft or engine into a, a 152. So your only option is to just disassemble it, put it in a new crankshaft. Re-register it as experimental. It's experimental, yeah. <laughs> Sell it as a kit to the next guy. Almost complete. Brand new engine. Here's the prop. I just didn't put it on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, typically there are there are bushings uh, pressed into the flange and I say typically because certainly at constant speeds don't do that you could just take a look at this one right here and you can see that on the back end of this if you can see it are a bunch of studs sticking out are going to go through it and nuts will go on the back side of this. So this, this particular propeller would not have uh, bushings for these to screw into, but it does have indexing pins. So the crankshaft flange is going to have eight holes in it, three of them kind of close together. Typically, the bushings are pressed into the flange. Let me see. Uh, which, which the prop bolts into. Three. Oh, yeah, the bushings. This is more of a light combing thing. Uh, may include, and they call it a master bushing. master bushing uh, to prevent I should say to help but to prevent prop from being incorrectly indexed is the word but I'll put installed index meaning it's not where it should be when the engines a top dead center if you like and why does that matter because incorrect uh, positioning can cause vibrations that you do not want. And then this is what I talked about incorrect. Let me see, I want to write that one. I wrote incorrect installation will allow prop to push out the master bushing, but incorrect prop installation can inadvertently 
push out, push out, master bushing. So pay attention. You should never, ever on any component, on anything on aircraft, unless it was intended to do this, use the bolts, the bolting on an item, to press it into something. And I can't think of offhand anything that, that works that way. Every single thing in air aviation goes together and then is tightened. You don't use the bolts to pull it in. If you're doing that, you gotta ask yourself, why, why, why are we doing this? I'm trying to think of some stuff in the shop that I know everybody says, I'm like, ah, oh, don't do that. Huh? There's a good example. The very next thing I'm gonna talk about, a thrust nut. It was designed to do that. Um, when you're installing a prop, where are you gonna get your data? You know, as to how it's clocked on there, you know, if it top dead, put the engine in top dead center, should it be this way? 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 That way? What, what, where are you gonna find this information? Whose service manual? Because a lot of these guys are keep looking in the light combing manual when you're when you're you're putting a prop onto a light combing engine, you got the light combing manual out and you're like, I can't find it. Keep in mind, best of my knowledge, light combing, continental, never went to a propeller manufacturer and said, What kind of prop should we put on the front of this light combing? They sell that light coming, they sell that Continental and engine manual to an airframe, Cessna, Piper, Beechcraft, and Beechcraft decides what they're gonna put on their Cessna. So, install per airframe manufacturer's instructions. So that's, I know it's really confusing. You're installing a part on the engine. It's not an engine thing. You don't find the information in the engine overhaul manual. It's an airframe item. So depending on what type of airframe it is, it's gonna be a different manufacturer? If you have a Cessna, what manual would you look it up in? If you have a Piper, what manual would you look at? Right. Okay, now I'm gonna add just a touch more confusion and that the propeller manufacturer has a say in how their props go on the airframe. And for me personally, I will let the prop override the airframe. So it has become such a critical thing and people screw this up so bad that often if you're working with a really good prop shop, when you get your propeller back, they will hand you a little cup of grease. They will have a sticker on here that has the torque. And there you go, sticker right up there tells you exactly how to put it on. If the airframe manufacturer's instructions differ from this sticker, I'm going with that sticker. And the grease is for the? For the nuts if they want it. Okay. Just like we've been taught. On the threads, on the face of the nut, it goes on. So what are my instructions? Oil that shit up. Propeller installation instructions. Lightly oil the O-ring. There's an O-ring right inside of here. Um, and hub bore surfaces only, wipe clean propeller face, bolt engage, that's upside down. But liberally apply grease, alpha 1637-16, mil T, and it goes on, only to threads of studs and nuts, also to face of nuts and spacers. Torque nuts to 50 to 45 pound feet. Because inch pounds would have been really bad. <laughs> That's finger tight. <laughs> so, it, like I said, it's gotten so bad that they just decided, man, we better, we better put, we better stick the instructions on it because people just can't seem to get this right. So, if you install a prop and the instructions are on there and you screw up, oh man. <laughs> so if you work, so I don't know what to tell you. If you work for a place that doesn't have the air, airframe manufacturer's instructions, you can like call up Cessna. If you work for a place that doesn't have the airframe stuff, 
You what take your tools, you put them in, and you walk out the door. If it's beat up, for example, if it's you can't read it, you make your tools and walk out the door. Help me out here. I'm serious, and he is too. I'm dead serious. Because you know what's going to happen in about a year from now? You ain't, you ain't gonna have an A and P so license anymore. Wants to get one, they call. So how about a plane comes in that you don't yet have a manual for? There you go. It's so new that it just came off the. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. it's, it's the Z model, and you only have up to the Y or something. Yeah. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Yeah. You have to go buy it. You have to buy that manual. You cannot work on an aircraft without the proper manual. That's a law. And you and you just call Cessna, for example. <laughs> or... That's what they're gonna say. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they're gonna say, "Oh, you would like a manual." Call ATP, they handle their man our manuals. So you'll call ATP and ATP will say, oh, we've got that manual. That's $5,000 a year subscription. What's your credit card number? <laughs> so, so it's possible to get the manual. So then you go on to oh, yeah. Reddit okay. and find the dudes who put it on there for free. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember. I just got a quote for manuals for us. I want to say it was 6000 a year for just the Cessnas. A That's year. What it costs. That's what it costs. Yeah, it is, but a lot of shops won't pay for it. It's sad. So then they just don't want, they just decline to do that job. Yeah, sure. <laughs> nope, they, they do it anyway. They the sad. Model. They get the older one. Okay, there is a thing since we're on that rabbit trail. You have to have the correct, you have to have the correct and current manuals. What does correct and current manual mean? Well, so, I probably already told you this. Somebody once sold, told me, no, it was Larry Johnson. You guys know Larry? Yep. He told me that, hey, I heard correct and current manual is the manual that came with the airplane the day it rolled off the assembly line. So in other words, right, my 77 Cessna, uh, trust me, there's a, there, there is a 2020 manual out there, I'm sure. Okay, so... Do I have to buy the 2020 manual, or can I can have the 1977 manual with no revisions for my aircraft? You tell us. All right. So Larry said it's the 77. I thought, eh, <laughs> let me research this. And I researched, and it didn't take me a terrible a couple hours. And I eventually uncovered a letter from the FAA written to some person who said the current and correct manual is the manual that came with that aircraft the day it rolled off the assembly line. Jesus. No revisions were needed because yeah. that is the current and correct for my airplane. And that's what the FAA says? Mm -hmm. That is. Why, why, would, why do they do that if there's, current, if there's more up to date? I don't, understand. I don't know. So, so on my opinion? So it's legally <laughs> legal to do that, but your opinion is saying go with the most current. You yes. Most current. Absolutely, you should go with the most current right. because if you ever end up in a court of law. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Nick, can you tell me, did you use the most current manual? Yep. Yeah, and what was that manual? When was that produced? It says here, is this the manual you have from 1977? But then, and then what you do is you pull out the letter saying, this is the current model. Yeah. I, uh, from the we had this conversation, I think, when, when Michael, he's an attorney, was in here. And he said, oh, absolutely. You would just be just hammered in court if there was a better and more current manual and you didn't. Yeah. It just shows that you have a lack of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a negligent thing. It's like, so you could have used a newer manual, you know? Right. Yeah. Kind of right now. Yeah. <laughs> and why didn't you? Is there any other thing else we should be worried about that you weren't, you know, so yeah. I, I don't know. It's just, okay. it's a fight I wouldn't want to have. <laughs> Are you referencing the specific year, make, and model? As far as stuff that, you know, sets them. Yeah. So you're saying that one that was come twenty years later, which may or may not actually apply to their upgrades rather than revisions. Oh, okay. So well like if you had if I had a seventy seven and you have a seventy eight, right. you can't use my seventy seven manual. You better have a manual for seventy eight or newer. Yeah. whatever your airplane came with when it was brand new, that manual would be acceptable. And then I know you're asking about that manual does come with revisions. No, it was actually unrevised. That one is the way I read the letter. Okay, on the flip side of that is you've got a 77. Yeah. There's manuals going up that 
2020. Yep. But the 2020s read you've got a glass cock. It comes standard with a glass cock. That yeah. Yeah. That manual just due to the instrument panel. Um, should no. They they actually cover backwards too, but it would have it would say something like, okay, if it said covers model years, twenty twenty three to twenty twenty, yeah, I can't use that one, but there are revision dates and manuals that a part number of manuals that came out much later for my aircraft. Yeah, well, they, they fix errors. And yep, they fix errors. One of the huge sections. I mean, it's very very thick. I think it, it almost added a quarter of the manual is. Um, uh, corrosion prevention and, and inspections and stuff. I mean, it's just a giant thing. So, but it's not really difficult to find it and make your manual like newish. So, anyway. Yeah, take the time to make sure you have the most current. Most current. But more importantly, more importantly, use the right manual. You know, like if you can't find a specific torque for an engine, what is the next source you go to? Not the AC. Not the AC. <laughs> Not AC 4313, because that is for? Airframe. Airframe. Airframe, see? This guy knows my stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually in the engine manual. So if you can't find it in the engine manual, look again. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. Or it's not part of it, right? So you can't find the torque for the exhaust. Why not? Because it's an airframe item. Mm. Take notes if you have a good engine. Yeah. Question about prop torques. Yeah. Are they customarily wet torques? No, not at all. I think all fixed pitch are dry torque, and the constant speeds are typically so wet with that grease, that special oh, okay. grease. Like yeah. So even fixed pitch is not no grease whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, let's see, install per the airframe manufacturers. All right, typical position. Almost all of you have already figured this out the hard way. Typical position, uh, it's really for a two blade. B L A D E, two blade, uh, four cylinder, because that's really the most common. Um, you're going to place engine engine at TDC. Oh, we can put it on number one just so we have something to reference. I mean, top dead center is top dead center. It really doesn't matter. So I can just say place, place it on top dead center. And it doesn't matter which cylinder. Install prop horizontal. And then move prop, not the engine, because that would not work. Um, one bolt hole in direction of rotation. So place the engine on top dead center. Take your prop, put it on there. Horizontal. Horizontal. Then take it back off. One bolt hole and put it back on. And there you go. So top dead center is going to look just like that. Why that position? That position, I think, just came from the fact that that's the way airplanes had to be. The prop had to be put on to hand prop airplanes, and so it just stuck. Uh, <laughs> don't forget spinner bulkheads you have a metal disc that goes on the hub then the prop goes on then the prop is bolted and the spinner goes on and so if you so you do a fantastic job of putting the prop on. You spend all that time getting it torqued and it's perfectly safety and it looks just beautiful. And you're like, oh crap, this went on first. So <laughs> extra piece. Extra piece. Um, oh yeah, torque. Maybe you just did it better than me, yeah. Um, torque. With a proper pattern.
All right, kind of a star pattern. Don't start in one spot and go around in circles like that. That's a bad, bad thing. Especially if you have a wood prop, if you start at one spot and you torque it to max, 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 it's gonna be crooked when you're done. Then how do you fix that? Well, you take it off and send it to a prop shop and you hope that they can mill it down flat again. You can actually put shims in, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, let's see, safety. Yes. Trust me on this. <laughs> You're right, though. It seems that way. Yeah. It does seem that way. In fact, when I um, we had a, gotten that, that argument with our old tool room oh, guy. Through the biggest resistance is on the compression stroke. Yep. Not after about this time. Yes. So you're you're actually pulling it pretty hard right here. Yeah. This is where the most, and right when you get here, it's going to kind of carry its own momentum. Otherwise, you're going to be starting it here vertically. Oh, yeah, because, because it's already up top. It's a, yeah. Okay. Uh, safety with, oh, here it is, 0 .040, so says Sensenich. Or safety with 0 .041, so says Macaulay. Now, I don't have the um, Hartzell down there. I don't have a picture of this, I don't think. But the worst safety job in general aviation is the uh, these uh, constant speed props. Oh, I forgot. That's going to be a cool. That's my best video. Um, this could be a good week. All right. Uh, Anyway, there's, it's worth your, there's, uh, we have a mock-up of a light coming with a turbocharger hanging off the back. It's kind of hidden by the drill presses. Take a look at the propeller on there. Eventually you will, but I would do it tomorrow. Walk by, just look at how that's on and safety. It's kind of a mock-up because I had to do something. I had to put nuts on one end where they're not normally, but the way it goes on there is you have studs that stick out of the back like this, and then you use, uh, no, I take it back. You don't have studs. They made bolts out of studs, drilled studs, with a castellated nut. So you got a castellated nut on a, on a stud, right? Instead of putting a cotter pin, they put a roll pin so you can't take it apart. And those go in there and then you have to put safety wire through those roll pins, and it is buried down in there. It is really, really hard. So you'll get to do that in a second here. All right, so taper crank, we got that. No, we didn't do that. All right, so there we go. So that's our, our flanged crankshaft. Take away from that, make sure you put it on correctly. We're going to use airframe manufacturer or propeller instructions to install it, not the engine. We're going to not pull it on with the prop bolts so we don't screw up the master bushing. And that leads me to taper crank. Taper crank was used on low horsepower engines for the most part. Right there. It has, unless you're watching it online, you can only see part of it. Uh, it's got a keyway in there, very large keyway. Got to make sure you put the keyway in. It's very important. And it uses a hub that goes on there. Now, this hub is similar to mine. I know I've told you the story before about how this works. This is a tool slash installation slash removal tool, all in one. All right, so the prop is bolted onto here. You can see there's also another disc that I don't have, so the prop is going to go between those two discs. And to get it on, you're going to make sure you have the keyway installed from the other photo that's going to go in that notch right there. Very long key, and that keyway goes on there. 
and then you will tighten this to the proper torque. And then there's a hole in the crankshaft and you put a pin. The pin goes from the inside out because centrifugal force is going to keep the pin in. And you put the cotter pin in. See how they got the pin right there, kind of going from the inside out. Yeah, they're leaving early. Yeah, they're watching the game right now. Oh. All right. When you go to take it off, you loosen this up, and then it's going to get real loose. And you keep going, it's going to suddenly get really tight. What it is, there's a ring in there. See the ring right here? Mm -hmm. There's a ring. It's going to hit that ring. Now as you turn this, it's pulling this off of the taper shaft. So it's a puller and installer all in one. This you can turn to put it on. Don't forget, I talked about the Prussian blue inside. I talked about this before. So you got to put a little bit of Prussian blue in there. Let's stick your finger in there. Prussian blue is still any on there? Not much. Oh, yeah, I left so much right there. It doesn't come off. It just keeps on spreading. <laughs> so, all right, there's Prussian blue, so you put a little, remember the formula, something like you uh, take out half of what you think you need, then take half of that, and that's twice as much as you should put in here. And uh, so you put it in there, and then you put this on, then you pull it off, and you must have a contact area of C or better which is 70%. So you got to have a C. All right, let me see. Taper crank. Uses an adapter. Who's watching the game? I think it's second year. Well, in here. What's the score, Mark? <laughs> Just wondering, is like close to the end or? Yeah, yeah. yeah fourth quarter, nine minutes left, Warriors up by 10. Oh. All right. It is found. Oh, my pin is not working so great. Found on holder. Well, this is not wanting to cooperate tonight now. It's tired. Found on older, what am I going to say here? Low horsepower engines. Found on older, low horsepower engines. Low. Do you realize how ambiguous that statement is for my Yeah. Because you just said 1940s. Yeah. Yeah. So 1940s. <laughs> Anything 70s and on is newer. Anything pre-70s is mid-range. Anything 50s and 40s is older. <laughs> 65, 75, and 85 horsepower. Mostly the 65s and 75s. I want to say there are a few radials that might have, but I don't think so. So... Old A65s and 75s found in 1940s aircraft. I could have said that the first place, huh? Then somebody will argue with me. Not here, but you know, YouTube. Well, that's not true. All right. Um, so installation. Let me see. Um, yeah, it uses an adapter hub. I got that. Installation. Needs to be checked. Let me see, uh, with Prussian blue. It's like freezing. It's P-R-U-S-S-I-O-N, blue. <coughs> Russian blue. So we add some of that, and we must have 70% contact area or better. Mm. 
this is just not going to work. All right. 70% contact area or better. If less than 70%, clean and you lap it in place. Um, remove, remove all the pressure blue, put it back on, and put what in here? Bondo? Bondo is not correct. <laughs> And I sneeze. Yeah. And this is one of those things, too, where I take it off. If I had an airplane with this on there, I take it off every single year and inspect it, put a little bit of new anti seize, because they tend to seize on there. That's not good. So, some anti sneeze. Um, you will enjoy the torque when you get to the ground adjustable. 140 pound, 175 pound oh, what? Yes, uh, sorry, uh, these are the, this at, is the way the book was written. At 31 inches. At 31 inches, but you cannot use a, you cannot use a woman of that size because that would violate the book. <laughs> Sexist. It's exactly 175, right? It's, yes. Yeah, it's exactly 175 pound man at 31 inches. For 30 foot pounds of corn. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Nowadays. Just change your programs. Just don't, just don't no. go there. <laughs> My, our industry at one point, I don't know if we were sexist, but maybe that's what you call it. Because even the service bulletins were all, you can tell the age of a service bulletin because it would start gentlemen. And then it would go into the service bulletin. <laughs> I know. We have changed. We have grown up. Uh, okay, so that's the big thing on there. It's a puller, installer. Don't try and take the snap ring out. <laughs> we, in fact, we did have a friend of Phil's brought his plane over and was like, how the hell do I get that off? <laughs> like, well, it's simple. You put this in here and it's a puller. And I, he goes, really? And he, you know, yeah, I do this. I told him how and he came back and he was here and he's like, well, it came out. I'm like, what? And I looked in there, I'm like, where's the snap ring? What snap ring? I'm like, oh, you don't have a snap ring? So we had to get this snap ring out, put it into his, use the snap ring, pull it apart. And I want my snap ring back. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right, time to go.